All right, so this is a painting I'm working on right now, and for the most part, I'm basing this on a, a small study I did. And if you looked at the, um, maybe the inspiration for it, you wouldn't see anything actually that inspired me that ended up becoming the, the painting. Um, the more I paint, the more I just move things around. Because uh, I think, you know, composition is probably one of the more interesting aspects of painting, I think, for me, is the placement of objects and how you think about the spacing, you know, moving the eye through the piece. So when I, when I work on a painting, I think a lot about composing, you know, from top to bottom and side to side, more in a flat sort of way first. And then um, after I do that, then I start thinking about things to, you know, lead the eye, you know, just like these marks here, you know, you're, you're leading the eye up into the, the painting here. You know, these things are framing things in a kind of a circular sort of way. And then there's, you know, some movement back here as I've got little objects and stuff back in space. So, uh, but first, it's just all about flat. And so, and mass things, separation and yeah, shape making. Exactly, and, yeah. And I think uh, sometimes I, I, I really like flat areas more than I like want to have more depth in it. Uh, so I kind of play back and forth with the, kind of the abstraction of it. So this, you know, the barn and all these structures here are just kind of made up. Maybe if I need to have some sort of uh, reference at some point to maybe put in a little bit more detail in there that I need. I might, but if it doesn't, if it means like the spacing of this uh, versus the spacing of that, if it, if it makes them equal, I don't want to do that, obviously, you know, I want to uh, kind of, um, you know, have some variety in the size and the shape of things. That's why this is, you know, short and skinny, and this is a little bit different shape, this is a different shape, uh, you know, to have that kind of, you know, thing going. I also think a lot about these, you know, how the edges work here and just the interest of that line and the way, you know, where do these little dips go? And, you know, making sure that this dip is not the same width as that one. Yeah. You know, you just go down, you drill down, you, you do it on the big level, you go on the, the smaller shapes and then even, you know, smaller than that, you have that, that, that depth to it. So that's kind of what I'm thinking here. Here I'm still, still need to do some things to kind of develop some subtlety, you know, in the piece and take it, you know, a little bit further. Uh, at the same time, there's always some back and forth with it where I might go with more detail and then like back it off. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a give and take to it. The other thing I try and do because nature, you know, this natural sort of feeling I want to convey, I use a you know, variety of tools and things in order to make the strokes feel natural as well, right? There's different types of um, ways to apply. Basically, you're using the physics of nature, which, you know, if something, if you have stains on a rock, it's because of gravity, you know, taking water down on a rock and it creates a certain pattern to it. Well, the, the physical nature of paint, if you use you know, certain physics or get it wet enough or whatever, it's gonna do the same thing that does out in nature, so it'll feel more natural. And so there's an element of that that goes on with it. A little bit of alchemy, I guess you could say, in order to get some of those same kinds of natural natural feelings to it. Uh, so anyway, I, even though this is a landscape, I, I look at it as, you know, kind of an abstract problem to solve. Uh, and, you know, how does this balance with this? How does this and this work together or you know with these colors here and, and that color here what is you know this balance with some of these greens and reds that i'm working on i mean it's generally a red, red, uh, red and green color scheme but how do i get it to be a little bit more interesting than just you know you don't want yeah. it to be a Chris, red christmas tree yeah. <laughs> you know it's that red and green colors you know that you want to have you know influence of some of the other uh, colors in there in order to make that work not to mention just, you know, understanding the, the atmosphere and the, 
in the background and how that's that's which work comes from space. a lot of observation. You've you've done a lot of outdoor painting in your Tons past. Tons of outdoor painting in order to that. get this. Yeah, lots of little studies. Uh, you, know, you can see here. Do you mind just, if I pan through? You some can of pan these? through some of them just quickly. Some of them are, are dogs, but. <laughs> this is this is what every art studio should look like. Just just tons of tons of work. stuff, right? You're just working and working and working. This that's uh, I think what's inspiring is is just seeing the you know the constant Piles aspect of, of of yeah not not just it's not just production but it's it's um, it's study. It's it, there, it, it, when I walk into a studio and see all this stuff, it's yeah. there's just a love for it that is obvious yeah and i think you know like a painting like this uh, i'm never going to sell it but this was you know the river that's just in my backyard and you know it's just an exploration of some greens and and the space of it and you know i learned i learned stuff from that i learned from you know how this shadow comes across the white rock and then what does it do once it hits the water you know just little ideas like that uh, become things that you learn about and you apply to the next the next uh, image yeah. or you look for right so yeah all right that's it i'm ryan brown and uh, this is the unvarnished podcast and we're in the studio today of brian mark taylor and i um, super excited about being here it's it's been hard to get a, a hold of a lot of artists just because the COVID thing and, um, you know, people are taking certain precautions. And, um, so thanks for letting us in. Absolutely. Happy yeah. to be here. Um, and you moved here, uh, you live, you live in Alpine, Utah. You live, you moved here from San Francisco. Uh, how right. long ago? Uh, let's see. It's been, well, I guess you could say four years now. Okay. Crazy. That it's been that much that yeah. long or that quick. Still somewhat fresh. How long were you it in is. San Francisco? So we were there 15 years. Okay. So most of my adult life, wow. we had our kids there. Uh, it, you know, it was it was a shock to come back to Utah. Yeah. Well, uh, so you grew up. I actually in grew up in Utah. Right? I did. Yeah, up in Bountiful. Okay. Yeah. I, and and you know, just culturally, it it was really. It was just so different, right. right? Yeah, San Francisco is a melting pot of different cultures, and then you come back where it's kind of a, a little more homogenous, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you go to Bountiful High? I did. Bountiful Brave? Are you a brave? Yeah. I was just uh, <laughs> I was on a, a, a Facebook political argument with my sister because I think her kids are going there, and they they might want to change the name of the Braves because oh, right. they're, you know um, Native Americans and whatever. So we she's taking the stance of no we we're, should keep we're, we're braves and I, t I took the opposite stance so i hope she still loves me i love you sister <laughs> um <laughs> that was just last night so well maybe one of the things themes we'll touch on uh or at least that I, i'd love to talk about is uh i love i love change yeah and i think change is good yeah so well yeah it's a big change coming from from san francisco to here but you you um you spent a lot of time teaching. You got your master's at the San Francisco uh, Academy. Mm -hmm. Is that what it was? Academy of Art University. Academy of Art University, San Francisco. Yeah. And um, and then you taught there. Yes. Right? Yep. How long did you teach there? From 2005 to about 2011, I think, is okay. when I stopped. Just I took on other things and just exhibitions and things. It was just yeah. too much to do all of it. Yeah, and teaching so, is uh, time consuming. It is, yeah, yeah, but it's also very rewarding, as you yeah. know. It's something where you you have to excavate what you believe and what yeah. and why and what things are truly important. And yeah, verbalizing con concept uh, visual elements is it can be hard at first, but it helps you so much to understand why you're making certain decisions and and kind of uh, have a, a little bit more clarity as you're working through the process when you have to explain it to somebody else when you got to break yeah. it down so well, and i think there's as much an art to a great teacher as there is yeah. into painting or creating your own artwork yeah uh, you know you, as you know there's great painters horrible teachers and yeah. there's maybe teachers that aren't great artists but they are excellent uh, yeah top not so good at that yeah yeah, yeah i've had both um, and what was your experience before that, before, 
San Francisco. San Francisco. So I I took my I did my undergrad at BYU, and um, when was that? It so seems like see. we would have uh, overlapped a little bit. Yeah, that's. Um, Were you in the so, art program or? So I did my freshman year in 1995. Came back in. That's 90. when I was a freshman. Did no you kidding. stay on campus? I did. Where? Oh no! Actually, I wasn't on campus. We were in a, we were. Uh, my parents owned a, a building there, oh, okay. so we. Okay. Uh, I was with my brother and sister at the time okay. for my freshman year. I was yeah. partying it up in the dorms. Were you? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah. I actually got a lot done uh, because being away from that. But I do wish I kind of had that kind of party experience. Yeah. But I guess maybe long term, uh, the more focused kind of academic stuff was actually a good thing for yeah. me. I, uh, uh, I look at that as like the best year of my life. No offense to my wife and kids, but, <laughs> but it was like the most irresponsible, like nothing but fun yeah. year of like last, you know, push of my childhood, you know, cause then you're LDS. Yeah. I was LDS. We go on a mission. You go like, you know, when you're young, yeah. um, those formative years, and then you come home and, yeah, in the it's culture, you kind of get married or pretty early, and, and then kids, and it's just it happened so fast um, that that freshman year was like my sort of final <laughs> hurrah. It was really great. Absolutely, so many great friends from that time. Uh, so, did you come into the program at BYU um, um, and go into design, illustration, graphics, or did I was in the fine the art? art okay. I was in the fine so art that's side. That's why we didn't. Uh, yeah, that's probably, probably why over overlap. Yeah. Because yeah. they were in, um, I mean, I guess they've always been in the. So we must be the exact Wilkinson. same age. Yeah, forty-three. I'm forty-two, so okay. I'll be forty-three next month. Don't don't rub it in. <laughs> yeah, uh, so we so must, graduated yeah. ninety-five. I graduated yeah. ninety-five and went straight to BYU. Uh -huh. um, and they were in the Wilkinson Center, the art program, and we were over in the Brim Hall at the time. Okay. Which so I was more in the totally opposite ends of the campus. Yes, exactly. Well, and I think that year they tried to marry the two and then yeah. ended up splitting up again. Yeah, you, that's you know the antagonism between the two. I do. I taught there for for three years and saw it firsthand. Okay. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of antagonism. Totally. And they, they did finally get together. Design came over to the Wilkinson Center for a couple of years, and that now they're totally separate again. Wow. So. In retrospect, I wish I would have gone over to the the art or the design school you know yeah. where they teach more technical things yeah, i yeah. think there's a lot there's a lot of confusion in the at least yeah just be frank in the art department there right. you know and i i think I, you you definitely see that and i think that's why uh your school has been an important part of have have an alternate yeah place to go to get more of that education that's so lacking in yeah in so many academic circles these days yeah uh i, I was really shocked uh you know, any university is going to uh, promote themselves and tell you they're, uh, you know, we're the, w this is the best university for this, or we're the great at this, or this teacher's the best one to take this from, or whatever. And you kind of buy in. I mean, uh, as a mm -hmm. young, naive person, for me, I, I had no art background. I didn't know anything about um, anything, really. <laughs> uh, I didn't know who Sargent was until like my junior year. Um, and, uh, uh, so I thought, well, you know, design at least has a commercial aspect to it. And uh, maybe that's a little bit more responsible. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Um, but it wasn't until I went to the Florence Academy that I really saw like a, a system that it was just so organized. It was a yeah. way of like presenting information in a, in a step by step um, progressional pro uh, right. process that almost like you're going to become so, a doctor or a lawyer, a professional. Yeah, like you're developing a skill towards something. It was, yeah. uh, it was just organized. Right. It's the uh, great. There's a great book called uh, Peak Secrets to the New Science of Expertise. And it, mm -hmm. it exp have you have you heard of that? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it expounds on the 10,000 hour rule. And it, it talk, mm -hmm. the three pillars it talks about are, are time spent, which is the 10,000 hour rule. Um, and the second pillar is that the time is spent on deliberate practice, meaning um, organized uh, um, yeah, elements of practice skill. that yeah allow you to to accumulate knowledge and skill and, and progress uh, in an organized way. And the third pillar is that it's watched over by somebody who's already perfected um, those skills. And that's what the Florence Academy was. It was it was just this um, 
scientifically proven way of human development, you know, towards sure. any, any skill. So I'd never experienced yeah. that. And I brought it back thinking, oh my gosh, you guys got to see this. This is so effective. And uh, it wasn't met very well. I mean, I was 26. So I understand like I just graduated, I left and now I come back pretty quickly and yeah. I start spouting off like I know all this stuff. Um, really, it's just an excitement to sh share it. Um, mm -hmm. And it didn't didn't go over particularly well, especially on the art side, because they were kind of under the same roof at that point. Yeah. So. Well, I think there's there's an aspect to that. And uh, something that I'd kind of like to address a little bit, that I think that's interesting, is there is a tribalism associated with human nature, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's very strong. And so there's there's these tribes, right? And there's been this kind of a takeover a back and forth between different schools of thought. And so at the Academy of Art University, it was going in more of an abstract yeah. avant-garde direction. And then the, the owner of the school, cause it's a private owned university. He actually back in the nineties, uh, fired the entire fine art department. Wow. And there were protests in the street. What a luxury to like to be able to do that. Have one guy that's yeah. in charge, which is impossible to do in a academic yeah, yeah. type setting. But in this case, so he, um, he 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 basically took all these artists from the art center of you know College of Design down in Pasadena, yeah, yeah. and then brought them up there. Just kind of replanted the whole thing. Yeah. Wow. So because at that time. Um, Pasadena started to kind of move into more um, like film stuff, animation, uh, gaming design. Mm -hmm. They started to go more conceptual, not necessarily conceptual fine art, but conceptual for film, for, for yeah. film and gaming. Right. Yeah. Which uh, and I think part of it maybe was because that those those dedicated artists, traditional artists ended up moving up mm. to uh, San Francisco. So and that is it's interesting it just shows the struggle between these different kinds of groups yeah. right and um so me going into one system which was the BYU avant-garde sort of system where there's a lot of like conceptualizing and yeah. experimenting and you know one assignment to another doesn't necessarily have right. any sequential following yeah. right yeah and then going to much more of uh, regimented, not to the degree of a, a Florence Academy type of experience, but more so in maybe the golden age of illustration kind of yeah, yeah. kind of way. But there, there's more of a system there, right? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what the Academy of Art was to some degree. The other thing, the other component that was part of it, and I think that had a probably the biggest influence on me was the the Chinese artists there oh, yeah, yeah. who uh, basically learned from the Russians yep. so it's kind of the Russian impressionism or the Russian the Serovs and the yep. Shishkins and right. that kind of vibe was uh, brought over yeah. I mean it was the the Chinese artists have kind of made it their own uh -huh. and then it, you know as it moves moves west here it yeah. came to the Academy of Art and so that's been part of my a little bit of my DNA too. Yeah, is that kind of influence, which uh, is I think is amazing. I kind of talked to Micah Christensen about this. Just uh, um, the it's one of the benefits of communism. If you if you want to point out one benefit is sure. that they they didn't necessarily go through the twentieth century of art the way that the Western art world did. They yeah. didn't have the um, the degradation of of skill. Um, which I think, uh, I mean, you can argue uh, all day about um, the benefits of modernism and, and maybe some progress that was made. But for a representational painter, uh, you have to admit that there's there was a lot of um, elements to the knowledge that were just completely obliterated, that were piecing back together. But the Russians still have it. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I found some Russian... Yeah, even today, right? Even today, just like these young... Russian painters coming out of the uh, Russian Academy that are doing these monumental uh, multi-figure paintings that mm -hmm. are every bit as good as like Lermite mm -hmm. in the 19th century. And, you know, it comes from that tradition, but the fact that it's still going um, gives me hope. I, I just, I'm, I'm desperate to like 
I, uh, bring somebody over and like, I can't, you know, I've got five kids. I can't really like pick up everything and go to yeah, Russia for sorry. three years, learn Russian and whatever. But yeah, I'm desperate to, to, um, tie into that tradition. And we're lucky here because mm-hmm. there are quite a few, uh, Chinese artists. Mo- I think mostly in California. I mean, the ones I know of the majority that, that yeah. have, um, great ties to that tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, me and Situ is like, mm-hmm. I mean, brilliant. This is, uh, this is Roley. What? Roley. Yeah, so yeah. Neon Situ. So the interesting thing about this, this group of artists that I've gotten to know them really well. Yeah. I've been over several times to China with them, yeah. seen their, soon seen their hometown. Yeah. Uh, there are so many great artists that came out of one school in the period of like, they're all like five years apart. Wow. It's, it is crazy, but it goes to show how an education, the rigorous education that they had at that time, and it's interesting, that, you know, at least three of them have the last name is Situ. Situ is yeah, a very yeah, common yeah. name. But uh, so Ro Lee and, and Mian were, were buddies there. And, uh, but anyway, just in this tiny little town wow. uh, in southern China uh, called Kaiping, uh, well, there's a little town in even smaller than that. And uh, anyway, this this little town is where they've produced all these amazing wow. world class artists, and uh, you know, just there was this intense training, and yeah. it was during. You know, they talk a lot about. Actually, they don't want to talk a lot about it, and I think it's just because of what happened, what they all experienced as children during yeah. the Cultural Revolution. They're just very careful about the way they talk about things. Yeah, and. I know it was a horrific time, and but a lot of these guys were handpicked over thousands of yeah. children to have that opportunity to go study, uh-huh. and um, you know they're just in some ways super lucky to be able to have that opportunity. And then yeah. so one artist, one of them comes first to California, and then they've kind of helped each other yeah. come and make that transition. So. And you know, a lot of great artists. We'll mention some: Mian Situ, Hui Han Lu, Zhao Ming Wu, Bo Ping Chen, uh, Calvin Liang. Uh, I hope I don't want to forget anybody. Uh, Ro Li. Uh, and there's there's a bunch more. Anyway, I, yeah. You know, you know, just this great group of of yeah. painters that have really have that discipline, and so a lot of them had to come to the Academy of Art University, and to in order to teach, had to get another degree to even do that, to even uh, yeah, be able to yeah. teach. So when a lot of them were like, so amazing, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you gotta um, have that paper. You gotta have the paper. Yeah. yeah. Which is so funny about academic things. And that's what I like about today is there are options out there instead of the, just the typical go to the university. Right. Like if you and I uh, were in our eight, you know, 18 or whatever, you know, university, I think, looks less and less yeah. desirable, right? I'm, I'm noticing that with a lot of young students I talk to, even high school students, they're so aware of things that, I mean, I went to uh, Florence in 2003 for the first time, and nobody had heard at that oh, point. Oh, yeah. I mean, Florence the fact Academy. that you even found it. I got lucky. Uh, um, um, a friend of mine, Dan Murray, um, had gone there for like a, a month-long summer landscape thing, and uh, in my senior year at BYU, inter- introduced me to it. And, the, you know, the, the web was pretty young at that point. And mm-hmm. so they didn't have a very good website. It was either that or Jacob Collins. And mm-hmm. um, I talked to Bert Silverman, and, and he said, go to Jacob. And I was like, yeah, I kind of want to live in Florence. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Who wouldn't, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, New York actually just seemed like such a harder place to achieve something like that just from a living standpoint than mm-hmm. Florence, even though I'd never been to Florence, it just seemed I'd been to Europe and yeah. was super inspired there. So I, I, uh, you know, chose that. And, um, but yeah, now it seems, um, so much more accessible. I mean, a uh, mm-hmm. quick online search and I, I have a lot of people that will find me just, you know, looking for say open figure drawing sessions or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's just so much more accessible than it used to be. And these, like you said, these high school students are finding that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, you know, there is still a, a kind of a, a hesitation uh, among parents sometimes because the field of, of art is still relatively unknown. I, it's not, uh, 
it's not a highly respected field. It's not mainstream by any means. Yeah. At yeah. least the traditional, you know, study the nude figure or two. It right, can be an right. issue with parents yep. and, you know. Yeah. And, and then just what are you going to do with it? The, yeah. the unknown of, of the realities of, of being able to make a living uh, as yeah. an artist, are, I think, are, are, are pretty unknown as, uh, to parents. Especially in this. Well, on the coast, I think it's maybe a little bit more known. Mm -hmm. Like California coast or the East Coast, there might be a little more of that. You go into the interior of, of the United States, yeah. I think it drops off really fast. Yeah, It's just not part of the, the right. culture. We don't see a lot of monument building or yeah. things here in this part of the world, really. Yeah, right? I mean, it's like saying I want to be a musician or an actor, and the parents are like, oh, well, yeah. let's have, what about a dentist? <laughs> what yeah. about right. something that will bring you some security? But uh, even then, I, I think uh, parents are uh, the, a lot of parents that will bring you know their 16, 17 year old, 18 year old kid in and to look at the school. They're so supportive, uh, which is huge uh, right. uh, when you're trying to go through this. I've had students that don't have a lot of support, um, and I've had students that have a lot of support, and that support makes all the difference. Yeah, well, and that's case in point with that the book you mentioned, Peak. You know, yeah. Anders Ericsson talks about. One of the things is having that support, yeah, and how critical that is. Uh, you know, if you look at Olympic athletes, you know they they have a parent that's willing yeah. to Spend drive the them all hours yeah. of the day to do it. You know, we have some people right next door that have uh, one of their kids is like becoming a world class uh, at dance at wow. uh, ballroom dance, yeah, and we get to see the behind the scenes of the work that goes into yeah. creating something like that. You know, the hours, the, yeah. like there's no life beyond, right. Uh, you know, you can't just go play yeah. with, with other kids kind of thing. Yeah. When I was yeah. in high school, I loved the idea of, uh, you know, the, the uh, saying, um, Jack of all trades, master of none. And I, I, I felt like, um, like athletically, I could pick anything up. If I picked up a ping pong paddle, I was pretty good. If I mm -hmm. swam, I was good. If I played basketball or whatever, I just felt like, uh, um, I was kind of proud of myself that I could learn math. I could learn whatever that, that if it was something to be learned, I could figure it out pretty quickly. Um, so I loved that. And then it wasn't until I went to the Florence Academy where I had to really make a decision. Um, it was like the third day I was there and, uh, I was over it. I'm like over it. I hated it the first three days. And I, and, uh, and then it occurred to me like, uh, cause they had told me to start over a number of times and coming from BYU, I just graduated BYU and I was like, uh, product oriented and mm -hmm. you know, get through this quickly. And so I told my wife, we're leaving. I hate this place. And then, uh, in my head I thought, uh, I mean, what do they want? They want it perfect. And then it just like, flashed like yes yeah, that's what they want they want to see perfect drawings mm -hmm. and then uh, I thought well if that's possible it was so clear to me in that moment I thought if it's possible um, and I say that I want to go that direction that's going to be my whole life I have to dedicate everything to that more than I've ever done before and I have to let go of all this other stuff mm -hmm. and I really wasn't sure if I wanted to do that yeah it's a it's it's a commitment in terms of that sort of uh level of refinement yeah right when you're after that sort of thing yeah doing you know. something great and doing something well are two vastly, Very vastly different, different things. things yeah absolutely yeah you give up a little bit of you know while my friends and things were kind of trying to live the life uh going on vacations and stuff you know yeah it was all about sitting and and drawing and yeah you know, a lot of years, at least my first years in California, it wasn't necessarily just going out and having a great time yeah. in, in California. It was, I look at those times as kind of almost prison in, you're kind of put yourself in prison a little yeah. bit because you have to, to really kind of figure some of this stuff out. Right. right? So I think that, uh, that's, it, it all boils down to that commitment. Like, like you say, yeah. like, am I going to commit myself to really, really go for this. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that's sometimes that answer for a lot of people is, uh, they think it's yes, but really what they're telling, at least when I taught at the Academy of Art, you know, they're paying a ton of money yeah. to go here, 
but you could just see that they're they're really struggling with their commitment. Yeah. And there's only in every class there was about three people that were that you could tell all over all the time. They were all in, right? Yeah. Attend all the workshops, all the extra yeah. figure drawing things, and and there's most weren't quite weren't quite there. Right. Well, even at, uh, I, I think the percentage of people that are, that are that dedicated, that have that level of dedication certainly rises with each kind of tier of, of, uh, um, streamlined education that you would go to. Mm-hmm. If you're going from a, you know, the average community college to a bigger university to the, you just, uh, um, Academy of Arts San Francisco or, or Art Center Pasadena um, to to something as streamlined as one of the academies like Grand Central Atelier, Florence Academy, Barcelona. Um, I think the percentage of people that um, are have that level of dedication rises, but it's it's still really low. I mean, I, I think if you're lucky, you have maybe 15, 20 percent. Uh, I would say of, of academic students that are, are totally, totally all in. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's a 1% thing. I mean, yeah, there's 1% that kind of makes it, I, I look at my graduating class mm-hmm. and there's not a, I mean, there's not a whole lot that kind of, I mean, what does it mean to say I've made it? I don't know, but yeah, you know, made a lifelong career is what I could say at least yeah. that in the arts. Right. Without yeah. going and waiting tables or doing some other right, other right. thing. I of all the colleagues that I have, I don't know any. <laughs> I don't know anybody in my graduating class that's kind of still. Yeah. That I'm seeing them in magazines or, you know, yeah. doing it. So it's it's um, there's kind of a you need to react that one thing is helpful as a as a teacher to give a reality check to some students yeah. and say, hey, look, this is. This isn't going to happen, you know. Yeah. Unless you're really going to be all in, right? Because it's a it's a competitive field, like anything, right? And it is kind of all or nothing. I mean, you, you can make a a career. When I was making that initial choice at, at, in Florence, I knew that I'd probably find happiness in doing mediocre work. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was so clear about that in my head. Like, I could I could be really mediocre th- at this on my on my own. And there's it's kind of a joy to that, you know, like I figured it out and, and I'm um, having fun and I'm not worried about it, but, mm-hmm. but then my competitive nature kicks in. I'm like, well, if other people can do it that well, mm-hmm. I at least want to try to mm-hmm. do that, you know? Yeah. And, um, and then, yeah, I mean, just absolute dedication from that point on. Um, and, uh, you know, I tell my students cause it's really hard. I, I was talking to Adrian Gottlieb about this once and, he said, why is it so hard to get people that are studying to learn a thing to do that thing? <laughs> it's just this common thing that all teachers are yeah. aware of. Yeah. And, and so like at, at the Masters Academy, we, uh, I noticed that, you know, when people were at the school, they were locked in. You know, you do an academic nude after academic nude after academic nude. They're just locked in. You do your copy drawing, you do your cast drawing, still lifes. They're locked in. But they don't go home and paint yeah, uh, for the most part. So we canceled classes one day a week so that we could give them one extra day throughout the week that they could work on their own stuff. And it's, uh, and then we have a composition class where we try to take their idea and, and take it to, to completion. So they're working on that from the first day that they're in the school. So, I mean, I try to, I tell them you're here because you know that it's important for your skill development, but I want you to feel like every day, like the school is in your way. This is not what you want to be doing. You want right. to do what's after that. So yeah, right. concentrate on that, concentrate yeah. on that more than you concentrate on this so sure. that this has an outlet. I'm learning to turn the form more, learning the structure of the figure and the anatomy for what uh, it's can't just be about getting good at figure drawing. Cause nobody, yeah. you got to go beyond it point. for sure. Yeah. Well, I think a, a part of it too is uh, and something that I'm uh, really big on is the curiosity, right? The, yeah. The, ha, being curi- being curious, um, and I I think competitive is is part of it too. I mean, we all have that competitive nature, but I think something that at least for me is a little bit mentally healthier is to go into a curiosity yeah. uh, mode where uh, you know I remember reading the biography of uh, Isaac Watterson about Da Vinci. 
and he, you know, he has notes and he said, uh, check on the tongue of the woodpecker. Yeah. You know, he's just endlessly curious endlessly. about things yeah. and digging into them and stuff like that. And I think, um, some humans are more curious than others. You know, like you go to a dinner, uh, some people like to just go to the same restaurant every time, order, yeah. the, order the same thing. One my thing parents, I learned, my parents will go to Hawaii and eat at Taco Bell. Okay, <laughs> I don't understand yeah. it. I don't understand. So, <laughs> but the other, I think, I think one thing as an artist and what separates somebody like a Da Vinci or you know some of these artists, it's not just the refinement that, I, which is a, an enormous part, right? Is refining and becoming the best technician possible. But there's also artists that go and i think this is where genius comes into part of it is that insane curiosity yeah. to really want to understand the world in which they which they live yeah and willing to go like an edison burn a you know a thousand different filaments in order to find the one that right. actually makes the light bulb right and so um that's one thing that i've really tried to do as well is just have that insane amount of curiosity so that like you say there's a, you could graduate and have a certain proficient level and uh, make some artwork that, that people will buy. Yeah. Right. And some of those artists for quite frankly can do a lot better because they're willing to just paint the same thing over and over again. Yeah. It's and easy to brand that. And, you can brand it. Yeah. Right. And you can paint that blue dog or whatever yeah. over and over again. You figured it out. You do them on, you know, Monday through Wednesday and then you play the rest of the week yeah. sort of thing. But then, you know, you meet other artists, um, like yourself where it's hey this is about a lifelong pursuit of of craft and yeah. of kind of an intense pursuit of of um how to create things right yeah, diving into the history and and uh, for me like becoming a part of the heritage and trying to um, somehow feel like i fit into this world that has so captivated me mm -hmm. that i can maybe add something that you know i, I remember the first time i decided i really wanted to be an artist uh, uh, were you at BYU when Bert Silverman had a show there? No, I was not. Um, or uh, maybe if we were there at the same time, it's very possible, but the fine art department didn't care. It was yeah. in it was in the uh, museum, and it was like ninety nine, two thousand, somewhere around there. So uh, I was there. Yeah. yeah. So he Missed had it. a big show in the museum for a couple of months, and I and it was uh, I would go there every day and you know, draw from these paintings. But it was the first time I had seen. Or I guess I was aware that I was seeing somebody who just painted whatever he wanted mm -hmm. and somehow made me care about it. Yeah. You know, it was just like such a pivotal moment for me in my consideration of where I wanted the direction of my life to go. I was lucky enough to tell him that at one of these face conferences. And mm -hmm. um, I always wanted to like give him that credit. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to get a, be a part of that heritage and be a, do, maybe do something at some point that... Um, inspires somebody else in the same way that I was inspired. It's just like, like that would be the greatest a a achievement is to is to make somebody feel the way I feel when I sure. when I look yeah. at art. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah it's uh, but it does it does require something else. It's, it's it, like you're saying um, the dedication, the curiosity. I think also just a pure love of it, the, the mm -hmm. love of the knowledge, the love of the history, the love of the material, the love of uh, uh, for us, you know, as representational painters, we're lucky enough to get to focus on beauty all mm -hmm. the time. We're just constantly recognizing it in places maybe other people might overlook. Mm -hmm. um, but, well, and that gives you a layer of a lens to look through the world that becomes much more fascinating. So, for example, you know, a lot of people would tell me, and we would drive back to see family. We drive through Nevada, you know, on uh, I I eighty, yeah. right? And a lot of people just talk about how much they hate driving right. through Nevada for me, you know, it's, and I'm sure for you and is you're just constantly looking at all the, the colors, yeah. uh, just the raw landscape, um, you know, with, with a bare landscape like that, the play of light and the temperature of the sky and yeah. things like that very much have a, I mean, that's what you get to focus on. Yeah. And, um, I just love those times of spending, it's a 12 hour drive. It's yeah. a long drive, but love going through those areas and just seeing how the color palette changes from, you know, when you leave in the morning all the way. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so that kind of mindset, right. Is developed as you kind of 
you know, you use your eyes and your mind in a little bit more of an intense way than, yeah. than most people would would look at it. You know, and I would describe things that were on the trip and people that have driven it for years are like, what? That's yeah. really there? You know, <laughs> yeah. just not, not seeing it or not even, not even thinking about it. So yeah. uh, I think you can get a lot more out of life just by, you know, having that kind of, kind of mindset. Again, I look at Da Vinci as the, the ultimate example of someone yeah. that in all facets of life are really intensely uh, interested and curious to yeah. find out. And that kind of drove him. Now there's, there's a kind of a, a bad side to that, like a Da Vinci type person. And I think I have a little bit of that as well is because I have so many interests, mm-hmm. you know, I'm interested in, uh, you know, designing things, products, and, you know, some other entrepreneurial things as well as, I'm interested in gardening, you know, we have, yeah. you know, a little bit of a farm in our backyard and, you know, I have, I have a lot of interest in so many different areas, biotech. Yeah. Um, and anyway, lots of different things. There is kind of this tendency where I can't, uh, I go and obsess in a, like a micro obsession yeah. for a while. And, uh, I couldn't, I can kind of get away from doing some of the other things that kind of you know, focusing, you know, cause you, you need to focus on like turning the form. Like you say, yeah, you can never do that enough, Yeah, you know, painting a ball or a face or right. whatever in light. I mean, you're just going to get better the more you do it. Right. But you know, I do also have this tendency to, you know, because of that curiosity, and I think Da Vinci or Vasari talked about Da Vinci or complaining that Da Vinci would never com- finish anything. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, it also enabled him to discover new things Mm -hmm. or like sfumato, this idea of how to turn the form in a unique new way. Right. Uh, Some of those inventions where he goes into a level of genius, Mm -hmm. I think you need to have that level of curiosity too. Yeah. And we've kind of compartmentalized. dive into anatomy and and so many different things that that helped everyone after that. Yeah, absolutely. And I... and I think a little bit of that or more of that is, I mean, that kind of thing is, is also needed in the educational system is uh, we kind of have, we pigeonhole people like going into just art. Mm-hmm. You know, I think art and science really need to be blended more than, yeah. than we do in, in a lot of I would love uh, to see please. literature as well, literature and music as well, um, be be uh, more interactive with with the arts. Also, mm-hmm. I, I've been thinking for a long time about approaching um, people at Sundance uh, to you know they have the Sundance Film Festival here every year, and I think it's an opportunity to maybe connect with filmmakers, uh, cinematographers, lighting mm-hmm. experts, directors to 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 talk about you know because when film first came around uh paintings were a big influence on film and george lucas you know has a big rockwell collection and and Mm -hmm. talks openly about his his uh, inspiration coming from a lot of rockwell paintings and now i think it's the opposite i think paintings are being being inspired quite a bit by film because film is sort of we're in that golden age of Mm -hmm. brilliant filmmaking and technology and you know things are becoming more and more naturalistic with with film and uh and, and I think it would be great to to interact with storytellers and and uh, cinematographers Absolutely. and directors. What, how are you thinking about this? How are you framing this? Mm-hmm. Uh, why would you choose this moment in the narrative to to pinpoint? Um, uh, how do you edit? Editing is a huge uh, a huge thing, and and I'd love to have a more interactive quality with with uh, variations of the arts um, because I think it's so expanding. You know, it when is. you go Absolutely. to a, an academy. You never talk about design. You never talk about composition. It's all uh, um, just just uh, te- technique, 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 and method, 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 and and um, you know. But what for? What's the out? You yeah. Know, what's what's what? Are, what are you trying to aim at here? And Once narrative is missing. Skill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to uh, try and figure out a way to open that opportunity um, for artists and art students to to talk to filmmakers because i think they're far ahead of the game when it comes yeah, to absolutely the storytelling and and how to frame um your imagery well and there's also uh, you know in in a lot of ways i love tradition i love things that are old i love things that are 
you know, I love painting things that are broken down and, yeah. you know, ancient. And, th But I also really, I love technology and just the cutting edge kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I follow everything that Elon Musk is doing yeah. and the same thing with uh, Steve Jobs. Did you Jobs. order your truck yet? <laughs> the Tesla truck? Yeah. Uh, I have issues with its design. <laughs> <laughs> Aesthetically? Aesthetically, yeah. yeah, yeah. I do. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I like his rockets better than his, yeah. uh, his... But some of his car designs are pretty cool. But anyway, um, I think uh, there... Uh, I see us, humanity, as becoming more and more of like a cyborg. We are part human and then also part we we lean on technology a lot yeah and i'm i'm instead of like saying no i don't want any of that i i think it's really interesting and that's where i've engaged a lot with uh concept artists that are using uh digital technology yeah. to leverage their skill into very interesting ways yeah um and also even you know something i researched for a while there's a, an artist uh, kirsten zernjewel She's a super intellectual artist, a really fascinating person, uh, and using um, really complex mathematical models to create some hmm. amazing forms that have never been seen before. Yeah. And also using mathematical things like Mandelbulb or uh, Mandelbrot set, hmm. uh, it, where they are these three-dimensional models using, uh, you know, you've heard of fractals and things like that, and how those algorithms kind of figure out how rocks crack and... Hmm these organic kind of things. Well, that kind of knowledge, um, they've plugged it into certain things, uh, movies and things to create new forms hmm. using AI. And I find that really fascinating because some of these forms are really, they're so strange yet they're so organic yeah. that they look like they could exist in nature somehow. Yeah. Uh, and so I just see that kind of thing adding, breathing new life into this traditional academic and all these other things that we love. Yeah. And so, uh, in some way, I don't, I kind of sit on, I, I'm, I'm in, I want a foot in both worlds. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I love the tradition and things almost, it's almost like the things that we've described in terms of the academic thing are a much, or more what we call more of a religious dogma that has have been built over yeah. many years they have certain prescribed methods. You know, when you go to a Catholic mass, you are not, your mind's not going to be blown with new technology. Yeah. Right. And that's, and we, we love that. Our, I think a human mind loves the, the repetition, yeah, the, the tradition and the deep kind of thoughts about the mysteries of God and mm -hmm. the kingdom of God, things like that. So there's a part of, um, my psyche and everybody's psyche that likes that. But at the same time, I also, like we talked about with a restaurant, going and ordering the new thing. Yeah. Um, I, I do see that we need to keep injecting the new yeah. with that. Too, Cause that's where I, I feel like that. What are you training for kind yeah. of thing? We have to kind of handle and make sense of, you know, the age that we're in, right. You know, even with, as we're dealing with the pandemic, we're dealing with, um, uh, misinformation and, you know, for, for instance, I got really curious about the flat earth theory, Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and instead of dismissing it outright, uh, I was, you know, curious to see, okay, so why do they believe what they do? You know, as ridiculous as it sounds, yeah. um, you know, why do they go in that direction? And I found that there's kind of like a, a religious underpinning that kind of anchors their lives. And there's kind of this group thing that yeah. for some reason it satisfies that part of the human psyche. Yeah you know, that's, that's needed there. And that even when shown evidence, it doesn't matter. Right. Because the, the, this, this desire for a dogma mm -hmm. is so strong in our human psyche. Yeah. Right? We, we crave the absolutes. We crave we do. something yeah. that, that brings us back to a concrete reality. Um, even though that reality is maybe just in our head. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, I, I'm experiencing that in a number of ways right now and and um a lot of the things i i used to think believe have crumbled in the last few years and it's just such a it's such a scary um like unknown especially well, yeah, raising exactly. kids and and like how do i teach you things that you know i used to know i used to just be like these are absolute and now i'm i'm just you know 
totally unsure of so many things in my life and yeah it can be it can be scary but um but there's there's also a freedom to it there's uh there's uh, a newness to it that mm-hmm. um well again i go to that idea that curiosity if it yeah. can kind of become i think that's where i find it it can be positive yeah because you're right that n- new stuff is is scary right yeah. i mean say if, you know even new meaning say you get an injury yeah your arm gets messed your 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 arm that you paint with gets screwed up i've got to get surgery on september 4th i got i'm getting oh, shoulder surgery. oh seriously, surgery. Oh, seriously? Yeah. for your you're right-handed right yeah, yeah. i've got a torn labor amount i'm going to be out for oh, like man. five months it's going to be a nightmare <laughs> so i can i can sympathize with that and that's where uh, my my arm i had uh major from painting too much you know plain air painting yeah. we do like five paintings a day and just it got so inflamed i had yeah, like I, carpal tunnel or yeah something. major major issues right and you know you have deadlines and things and yeah. like how do you stop because that you know it's my primary living we're living in california and yeah. so and so what but what that did is uh first of all i had to start learning a little bit with my right hand yeah to kind of block in the painting and then just do the final work with my left for yeah. a while. Um, but also at that time I started thinking about, you know, expanding what it meant to me to be an artist. Yeah. And I, you know, realized that there are, there, there's more than just putting paint to canvas that meant that I was an artist. And that's where I started thinking of, um, you know, my love of plein air painting is, uh, you know, also designing equipment that would, make more sense for more of a modern age so and that kind of i don't think i would have gone in that direction if i didn't have this kind of challenge that yeah that was thrown at me yeah and so um you know if we kind of that's that's how you know we want our kids to be resilient right because they're going to get beat down with something our students are going to get hit with something family issue or whatever things happen in your life how do we deal with that yeah right I think, you know, if we're using that creativity, using um, the optimism to, yeah. f- to find new things, right. I think that, that helps me be positive. I think 2008 was another time. That's you know, when I graduated from Florence Academy. You know, how scary, right? What a nightmare of timing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we have uncertainty right now. There's a yeah. global pandemic. You know, what's going to happen in the fall? The we all kind of talk about has, gallery world is so, I don't even know where it's at right now. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have, you know, we're wondering, right? Yeah. So looking at those kinds of moments and thinking, okay, what is this? This presents maybe a new opportunity for yeah. me. So, you know, one thing that we've done, and I think you're thinking of it too. I think, you know, you may not have ever done this podcast if your things were just moving along rosy, right? Well, or, I mean, you probably, I've been, I've been recording videos. I probably would not have done that. The podcast is really just like, I feel like I have so many cool and interesting friends. I, I you want to do that. It's, yeah. it's a passion uh, to, uh, my passions are painting and, and talking about painting. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to like, record but it's, in a way it's yeah. opened things up. I mean, yeah. because you can't travel as much, Yeah. you know, uh, for me too, like, Okay, so I can't go to India again soon, yeah. which I would love to do. But, you know, my backyard, there might be some more interesting. There's an opportunity that opens right, up, right. right, when something closes. Well, and you're, as a creative person, I think that's one, one of the really amazing things about learning to draw and paint that I think is ubiquitous, which is it, it's, it's about problem solving. It's about yes. creative problem solving. Absolutely. And I, and I think it would benefit everybody to learn how to draw and paint at least to a certain level because it, it's... Um, at its core, it's about creative problem solving. So when something comes up, uh, when you have a global pandemic, you're like, oh, nobody's selling paintings anymore, or my galleries had to close or whatever. Now what? And you just you go to the drawing board and you're like, what are my skills? What can I do? What what am I interested in? And 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 I think um, having those wide interests, as you were talking about that, um, I, I find that I close myself down. Uh, quite often to things because all the ideas I have, and I have so many ideas, uh, tend to always lead me away from the easel. And mm-hmm. that scares me a little bit because sure. my, yeah. I really, really, really like painting. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I've, I've guarded myself against a lot of it. Um, and I've learned through that, uh, from just from the refining process of how I spend my time, what do I really, really love? And it's, yes talking to people that are uh, and, and you, you know this as well as anyone 
our field is full of amazing people. I mean, some of the nicest people, some of the most humble people, um, some of the most widely experienced and broadly traveled people, uh, well-educated, uh, well-spoken, very eloquent. And, um, and I'm endlessly interested in conversations with these great minds. I read a lot of uh, like 19th century biographies about artists. Yeah. And how they always would uh, interact and, you know, yeah. go to parties with Whistler and Wagner and Sargent and Zorn, you right. know, not Zorn, but uh, Alma Tadema. And, yeah. and I think that's what I want to do with the people today. I want, I want to interact with every brilliant mind there is out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so that's a passion. Painting is a passion. But, uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, I tell my students, you're going to have a ton of ideas. You're, you're, you're going to have... Uh, I mean that we're idea people, we're creative right, people. Right. So, but you have to decide what your priority is. Yeah, there's, there's got to be a hierarchy, right? Yeah, you have to really set that up yeah. clearly for yourself so that you can give the, your highest priorities the most attention. Um, Absolutely. Well, and you know, case in point, I think, like for example, I'd love to do figurative sculpture, and I had you know some some courses while I was at the uh, Academy of Art. But, you know, I just thought that's another thing that's going to distract me from what I truly love. And that's yeah. you know, like painting. You kind of have to make that decision. You yeah. Know, that. And also, um, I know a lot of artists will like to do you know, figures and still life and landscapes and stuff like that, which is which is awesome. And I and, you know, I like do that to a certain degree as well. But I've tried to really, you know, talk to my like, what do I truly, really love? Yeah. And for me, it really landscape kind of comes to the yeah. the top of all of that. Right. And so, um, you know, you, you've made you, those trade offs, right? Yeah, yeah. But even even then, you know, I've been starting. There's there's imaginative landscapes that I've been doing. Mm-hmm. I've abstracted things a little bit more, like playing around with, you know, what degree, what level of abstract going yeah. kind of in and out of it a little bit. Um, but you know, every once in a while I think, well, you know, I should, why don't I go back into, you know, learning more of, you know, figure drawing and things like that. I enjoyed that, but I think, well, there's only so much time in the day, right? (laughs) And so you do have to make those kind of important decisions to say, you know, the end of the day, what is it that you truly love? And, you know, for me, travel and being outdoors and stuff is such a huge part of the joy of my life that... Um, you know, I realized that's kind of what, and I, and I, and I think I like to be alone more yeah. than, and so even having a, a person there that I'm drawing or painting adds a, a level of maybe stress in my yeah. life that I have to worry about another person. I tend to worry about people a lot as a, or I think about them. I, I can have concerns about them. Yeah. And so in order to kind of remove those worries, landscape is a perfect thing for yeah. that. It's just me self-isolation yeah yeah and I, I i definitely need that sort of thing and so realizing that about your psyche i think is an important part of yeah. the art what is it that forget the accolades and the the fame or whatever i don't have to forget it I, it's, never, <laughs> it's not it's, it's yeah, never it's been not a really thing for me <laughs> yeah you know but the the thing is like what is it about your life yeah. like the pages in your journal that are going to make you happy yeah you know i would love to have the accolades of making a big multi-figure painting. Yeah. But I wouldn't enjoy that process at all. Yeah. You know, I just wouldn't. I so. I did it thinking I would. Uh-huh. It was so... There were times that were so painful. <laughs> yeah. So painful. Yeah. Uh, um, suicidally painful. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was so crazy. Um, but then... Uh, I mean, there's a reward to that, right? There you did is. something really hard. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. But the idea of going back and doing another one is scary. It's scary. There's so much that goes, it goes into it. Yeah, it's, it's like brain surgery, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And so I think there's there's a balance with all that. You do want to stretch yourself. You don't yeah. want to shirk from, like, really going into things. Yeah. And uh, But at the same time, you you have to manage your psyche. You have to um, understand you've been given a certain amount of genetic material that makes you a certain way. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I find that um, 
I need to tinker a bit. Yeah. And to, in order to stay engaged, stay happy. Yeah. And maybe to some degree to the detriment of my gallery relationships who see a little bit of a moving target. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, like the Da Vinci type of person, I, 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 yeah. I have that kind of restlessness ab- about myself. Maybe it's a little bit of uh, just anxiety about wanting to experience certain things before I die. Yeah. You know, but I, I need to, I just kind of have to, have to scratch that itch and yeah. kind of, and I used to feel bad about it, you know, as younger, mm-hmm. like, but now I've, I've kind of fully embraced it. Yeah. Like, I think becoming self-aware, you know, with maturity and, and, um, first step, you know, is really learning what you love and learning what your passions are, learning, uh, what motivates you. I think even that is uncommon. Uh, um, you know, deciding to live a life of passion is, uh, you know, just not, not that common. So, I mean, that's a level well, of Well, there's a certain amount of scariness to yeah, it, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, there, there, I think that, that, uh, requires a certain uh, level of self-awareness and then the the further you get into it you just become more and more self-aware you feel like you're more uh, distinctly targeting the things that you want to do you're you're more um, uh, deliberately designing your life exactly how you want it to be and so yeah like I I'll tell students that uh, uh, if your priorities if you if you decide that your priority is um, marketing and making money and you you want that fame and fortune at least you're making that decision deliberately and go for it but mm-hmm. if you're saying like i really want to i'm i'm in this tradition of painting and i want to live up to bastian lepage and i want to okay that's has different requirements it does and yeah. you you there's certain things that slough off uh because that's but you did it deliberately you yes. chose that and maybe you don't have as much financial success because you're you don't spend as much time marketing but you're going to be just as happy as the person that did yeah. choose that you're right. those deliberate choices are really important and i do think that that comes with a, a pretty high level of of self-awareness so so i do want to talk about also um as you're you're saying you got in you had the injury and and that kind of pushed you into maybe a little bit more entrepreneurial things you've started strata easel mm-hmm. um you designed that you've got uh um, uh how, three four sizes uh, what, what's in that We've about six line? now yeah. six yeah and and um that and you know that like we were talking about before you know a lot of things that you you have ideas for take you away from the easel that um how does that influenced or not how has that affected um your production or or um just time wise how have you fit that because that's a yeah it's that's a it, big thing you're, I mean, you're going to trade shows you're you're uh, presenting right. these you, you got to take orders and ship them and right you're still probably in some product design mode and and manufacturing <laughs> i mean i'll tell you what once covid hit and you know it's made things really a pain. Yeah. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, there, there are those issues, right? But at the same time, it has allowed me um, a little bit more freedom to really kind of do what I've what I want to. You Is know, that from a financial standpoint, or to or, some degree? Okay. Yeah, to some degree. I, I mean, I'm super interested, and in, in, in hope I, I'm sure I'm going to offend somebody at some point. But I'm I'm interested in a couple of dynamics with painting. One is um, how environment uh, influences what we choose to paint. I know, like like mm-hmm. New York is such a more of a harsh environment than mm-hmm. than Utah, or you know, the way I felt in living in Florence is sure. completely different. The, yeah. the level of inspiration and then finances for for most of us is is a real. It's, it's an always an thing. issue. Yeah, yeah. It, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that if if artists say, "Oh, I just do whatever I want," and yeah. finances is never a consideration, is they're lying. They're either trust fund kids or they're lying. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And so it's. There, there's always that that concern and consideration, and I'm not saying that everything's just rosy and I can, you know, really just do whatever I want. I, sure. I do have a, a professionalism and feeling of a responsibility yeah. to deliver sure. certain things, right? Um, but I think one of the things, like, um, 
one of the things when I was younger that really I loved about art was the imagination mm -hmm. and reading, uh, you know, amazing books, Lord of the Rings, or which I think will it's a classic as much as Homer's right. Iliad is. It's just in a modern yeah. era, right? It doesn't have that same maybe cachet because it's not a thousand years old. Right. Once it's a thousand years old, I think it will. Sure. Um, and uh, you, you know, or like Dune. Dune is another. You know, is considered one of the great science fiction uh, trilogies. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's fascinating because it talks a lot. I love about ecology and it's a desert planet. And, you know, these guys are wearing these things called still suits to conserve their water. And, mm. and here he's developing some of these ideas that actually become reality later yeah, on yeah. in astronaut suits. And he's doing this back in the, in the sixties. Right. Yeah. And, um, I, I just think that some of that stuff really has had this kind of hold over me as a, as a kid. And, you, know, you hit 40, you go through kind of midlife crisis, maybe, I don't yeah. know. But I wanted to reconnect with the, uh, the, child, the child, right? The child mind that I, and the love that I, original reasons I got into art. Yeah. And, and kind of get back. And maybe I can bring some of the other things that I learned along the way to do something a little bit new and different. Um, and so that's been kind of a little bit of the pursuit that I've had right now as, you know, in, and I think you can appreciate this because you do, you know, some invented landscapes, yeah. you know, things that come through your mind, maybe an emotion or a feeling mm -hmm. you had that you want to capture. I have some of those things too, that I, I want to capture and they, they involve, you know, maybe a spaceship or something, yeah, yeah. but more, I'm, I'm seeing it on an abstract. I really with art, I appreciate, I love things on an abstract level, mm -hmm. even realism at its highest level, you know, like a sergeant painting or, you know, yeah. There's an abstract quality to yeah, the that's strokes. Just this organized, organized abstraction. Yeah, that, that's yeah. just so lovely. Um, or Nikolai Feshin, mm -hmm. you know, those surfaces. That yeah. You just want to just get up and just see that yeah. kind of stuff. And so this gives me an opportunity to kind of play with that and experiment, but also use atmosphere, aerial perspective, light yeah. and shadow. Um, you know, it's. It's frozen music in a lot of ways, yeah. you know, the staccato note, the, the long held note, you know, different things that you're, yeah. you're, you're putting into that, that you would do the same thing with something that looks more real. Yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with that necessarily, but that's kind of something that I'm really been interested in pushing. Is you're talking about some of the, the science fiction, um, or is that what you call it? Science, yeah, science, but you know, it's sort of the, the, the I have to because you know, as I abstract, it, yeah. it just kind of emerges into there's there's a nice aspect to it that leaves so much open for yeah. for the viewer to just like their imagination will run wild and and for sci-fi fans, that's, that's part what, of the excitement, right? Yeah, and there's this this sort of uh, um, so if you talk about. Uh, you know, like meeting movie directors, Christopher Nolan is somebody I would love to meet. I think, yeah. I think he's a genius. Uh, you know, I love his movie. If anybody knows Christopher Nolan, <laughs> let's get this guy hooked up. Absolutely. I'd love that. <laughs> I, I think, you know, Inception, um, yeah. you know, he did the Batman, Batman begins the, the, that trilogy that, yeah. uh, there's a cerebral aspect to everything he does and an abstraction to it yeah. that I think is really fascinating. Um, you know, Interstellar is just yeah. a brilliant, brilliant movie. Uh, and Inception the music and Interstellar, totally yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Some of my favorite movies, uh, and I think you know you get Hans Zimmer and his beautiful abstraction of the music yeah. behind those things, which are so amazing. That makes in 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 my mind as much as the films. I like the films, but if it wasn't for Hans Zimmer being yeah. a part of that, and so you know we talk about you know those guys are so inspiring to me, and that like propels my mind into a, you know a place yeah. that. I just love to to be and to think yeah. about, right? Well, that that reminds me of a, a conversation I've been having quite a bit lately. Um, uh, it goes back to you know me trying to do this big seventeen figure um, painting last year, and um, I, I always felt so isolated and like I needed so much help to to solve certain problems. One of the benefits of film is moving pictures. Uh, uh, the addition of, of music with it, the um, the acting that, that you get, obviously different attitudes and, and feelings from all the different actors. 
Um, but you have in a film, you have this conglomeration of so many brilliant minds coming together to create a final product. In painting, I feel like there used to be that in the 19th century, and maybe, maybe you've read this as well, but a lot of the biographies I read talk about uh, uh, the interaction that yes. was constant. Um, yeah. um, Sargent and, and Edwin Austin Abbey sharing a studio while they did the Boston Public Library murals and Wagner playing music and Alma Tadema coming down and critiquing them and Whistler coming by and the parties they would have. It, it feels like the paintings that were made were made in a, in a similar vein as cinema in that it went through a lot of different minds yes. before yes. it was finalized. And now... Um, it's one of it's one of the reasons I have a school is because I, I feel like I need a community of people that I can bounce things off of that will make me better. When you're mm-hmm. the only one, yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard to solve all those problems and check all those boxes and and you know make sure everything is balanced in the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, like uh, there's a great movie called I think it's called Genius. Um, it's about Tom Wolfe, the mm-hmm. inter- relationship with Tom Wolfe and his editor. And there's a great scene where um, they're going back and forth, and Tom Wolfe has come in with like stacks of of pages, mm-hmm. and the editor is just going through it with him. You said that three pages ago. This is redundant. This doesn't make any sense. This has nothing to do with the the mm-hmm. narrative. And uh, Man, I wish I had an editor sometimes when I was making yeah. a painting. Um, and and uh, yeah, I think that's something we could really learn from film. Is, I, I, I is totally to, agree. Um, yeah. some, have some sort of collaborative effort where it's still our idea. We're still um, you know doing the the bulk of the execution, but some we're, we're it's like a system of checks and balances. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just don't have that. Um, and I really. Right, and crave that. Well, part part of it. I mean, we're just so humanity is so much bigger now, yeah. and we're so spread out a little bit more. I mean, we can connect so easily, yet at the same time, we spread out. Um, I think that's why this need for you know these conventions and things that are happening. Yeah. Those kind of become, I think, those moments where yeah. we can maybe collaborate a little yeah. bit more. One thing that's funny though that I found, and is that. Even with these conventions, uh, a lot of these guys, guys, and I say that with men and women, right? Yeah, yeah. Will hang around together and maybe not mix with groups, kind of like high yeah, school. Sure. And I think uh, I was like, what a what a waste. Yeah. Like I I I've always wanted like just whoever I'd love I can be inspired by them, you yeah, know, yeah. and and just go from group to group. But uh, I think that those those can be opportunities to, especially you know, study with somebody you've. You, you have no interest in like painting like them sure. or whatever, but you could learn something from them. Yeah. You know, case in point, um, Joseph McGurl, mm-hmm. uh, fantastic yeah. artist, right? Uh, I took a workshop from him knowing, I, you know, I'm a different or I'm a different animal entirely. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, I, I'm a zebra. He's a lion. Yeah. Your intuitions lead you in completely different, different ways. ways. Yeah. But I learned a lot. I, I took a, a one day workshop from him and learned about his sight size method. And I yeah. found that immensely fascinating yeah. and, and also valuable. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, it's funny how some people are like, you like in my school of thought or whatever, a sight size is not, it, it, it does this or that, you know, sure. the ne- they talk about some negatives and which is, I think is ridiculous. Yeah. It clearly, it has, immense benefits right to understand accuracy where you're not where you're getting it wrong and things yeah. like that and, and and that's what i learned from from joseph mcgurl yeah and so uh there's just so much that if we're willing to kind of open ourselves up to yeah. like some of these different ideas uh, for instance uh i uh, wayne tebow mm-hmm. is was kind of an early influence and um i had the fortune of you know talking with him he bought one of my paintings it's kind of a neat experience. Yeah. Now, am I going to paint white, like Wayne Tebow? No, but there are some things about the way he abstracts landscapes that are quite yeah. fascinating, and it has been a part of a little bit part of my DNA. He and Richard Diebenkorn are people that you know. Am I painting like them? No, but do they have an influence on me? Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. So the, these, you know, if we're willing to be open to it, um, curiosity extends beyond just you know, intellectual concepts. Yeah. It's also our willingness to go meet with people yeah. that are totally different from yeah. 
how we are. Yeah, I find that like when I'm looking to maybe collect art, I want I don't want something I could do. I want something that I could learn from, something that's totally outside my wheelhouse and and uh, can inspire me and and take me to a new place. Because if I can do it, I might as well just do it. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, I'll have to show you a painting from an Indian artist that really fascinating. So di- so different. Yeah. yeah. And I bought a piece of hers. I wish I bought a couple of them. Uh, but anyway, it's we can we can yeah I can show you that maybe in a in a yeah we'll bit. have we'll have that section at at the end where we can talk about you know the art that you collect the art that inspires you um, and I, I do want to talk about um, you're also involved with the Sunshine Academy yes and so do you want to do you want to tell us a little bit about that so so the idea is kind of a little bit what we've talked about is is having opportunities to other than the university system. Uh, so here's an example. We have we've got NASA and we have SpaceX. SpaceX has put Americans back up into up into space, where NASA, with all the money and stuff, cause it's bureaucracy. They're just sure, way sure. down with it. That doesn't mean SpaceX hasn't relied on NASA. I mean, they've definitely collaborated and helped. But there's yeah. something about something being a little bit more nimble. I'm sure you felt this also with your academy. Yeah. So what I've wanted. To, to do for many years because I helped develop the online art program for the Academy of Art University okay. when it first came out in yeah. 2005. And oh, that um, was early. Yeah, so it, probably the earliest university to put out some art yeah. training. And I know a lot of professors that took classes and then to de- help learn how to develop their programs. Yeah. But anyway, um, I've always wanted to and felt like that's what I've wanted to have an online presence because there's people that just they just live out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. They can't afford, like you said, go to New York or it's right. so expensive. Or maybe they have a job that they have to hold down. And yeah. so I just feel that this online thing, it's not like being in person. Yeah. You know, there's there's something about that that's so great that it'll never yeah. be replaced. But the tools are getting better to at least you can make you can make a difference with somebody with yeah. that education. So um, I met a guy, Keith Wong, and he has uh, got all the, the tech side experience. He also studied art, and and so he has a love for that. Yeah. He went into corporate, got tired of it, and we kind of met. And he has all the skills that I don't have, right. which is all the all the nightmare stuff of plugging things <laughs> in and yeah. and handling all the tech and the finance and things like yeah. that. And so. Um, it's, it's been a great partnership to help, you know, artists, you know, be able to share some stuff and, yeah. and it's accelerated with COVID because of, yeah, just, we can't meet in person. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, we'd love to get you on a video. There, yeah. So. Let's do it. <laughs> I've started, I've started filming as well, uh, you know, specifically because COVID we're not sure, you know, what's going on. We had to close the school in mid March. We've been back for the last two months. Um, but. It, yeah, it's it's an interesting time, and I, I've always, uh, I've kind of, I guess, my experience in education made me really, really respect education and the potential mm-hmm. it has to unlock um, abilities that that you know otherwise might remain dormant. Had I Absolutely. had I just gone through yeah. BYU and and that was it, I I, I would be so incredibly limited because you know and everybody's different but like i really needed the structure uh, yeah, uh yeah. to to learn the things and develop in, in the way that i developed so so florence was pivotal for me um there's a lot of other people that you know f- are, are uh, things make sense to them in a way that maybe they didn't make sense to me so they can pick up a lot of things on their own which uh, i i really respect but um and because of that i thought i've always like held education up you know uh, really high and thought i don't want to water it down yeah and so i've kind of shunned this online stuff because i know how important it is to be there and have you know have live you know live models and study right. the anatomy and get that one-on-one feedback uh um in real time but at the same time i, I am realizing that uh there's a benefit to there's so much you know basic information that people need um, mm-hmm. just to get 
started. And if you can maybe help um, develop somebody's passion, maybe make it a little bit more accessible, maybe they follow the path and eventually find their way to an academy yeah. or whatever. But yeah. but you open up opportunities that otherwise, you know, wouldn't, they wouldn't have there before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Even if it develops a higher appreciation for sure. what is good. Yeah. That can be whether that person becomes, you know, the next sergeant or whatever. Sure. But if it if it enhances their quality of life, uh, you know, because we've seen a lot of people that are like medical doctors or things. Yeah. There's no way they could come to do. Yeah. Yet, if it helps them also say, that's a good painting and that's... Yeah. Because I think one thing that I'm sure you've complained about it, I think every artist does, is like, why did people buy that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that bad yeah. painting or whatever, right? Yeah. And you're you're just... Um, wish there was a higher level of understanding right. of what art is, connoisseurship, yeah. and I think, in that sense too, that doesn't mean I'm giving up on the student at all. But it, yeah. what it does mean is I do believe it has there's a multi layered purpose to yeah. it yeah. That, that can be a positive thing. There's a there's something I I also think about, and I'm I'm struggling with this. I'm not sure exactly how I feel about it. Um, this might be a little bit controversial to, to say. Um, but I'll say it anyway, cause who cares? Um, but I, I listened to a comedian who was given a workshop and, mm -hmm. uh, he said, um, one of the things that bothers real comedians is when hobbyists show up when they, when they, um, you know, people that might come once or twice a week to work on the material or whatever. And they come to the comedy store and, and they take up 10, 15 minutes. And this, this comedian was really upset at that he's like i do this every single night i really care about this craft this is my profession this is how i make my living and you're taking my 10 minutes to make myself better he was and he said all real comedians feel that way about people that are kind of doing it mm -hmm. and and i i felt that way before in art you know especially you go to the academy and you, you you're so it's it's probably the most um a streamlined a laser focus mm -hmm. of the of the schools that you know if you're studying art and so you 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 feel like you're dedicated just fully to this thing mm -hmm. and and so and then you go to the galleries and you see a lot of like dashed off yeah. things and you see yeah. you see the plein air movement and huge uh, um, right now and right you think well well, for instance, uh, I was in a oil painters, you, oil painters of America show, yeah, and I had a painting I'd worked four months on, yeah, and you know it's the biggest thing in the show, yeah, uh, it's ten times more expensive than anything else, and next to it is a, a small three-hour head study that had a ribbon on it and won an award, and, a, and and then a barn study that's like two hours that had won an award, and and to me, I'm like I I can't I can't compete against this, and so I feel that frustration of the comedian that like absolutely how do you separate yourself how do you how do you say that, you know this has value more value because maybe time maybe expertise maybe whatever but i'm i'm bending as well and and realizing that there is benefit to just getting information out there um, i i kind of hesitated i don't want to feed into the hobbyists i yeah. don't know if i want to I don't know if I want to perpetuate that, but at the same time, hobbyists buy art. They're yeah. interested in art. They, they, um, they're going to be in a lot of workshops that you might teach. Um, and you don't have to be the, the, uh, Olympic level athlete that has, that dedicates 13, 14 hours a day to a thing in order to be in my world. And, and so I, it's these, it's this, um, back and forth in my head uh, do you know what i'm saying yeah, do you ever yeah. have that oh absolutely I, I i i agree with you and the frustrations especially when it comes to like you know ribbons or things like that or just sales when you are in group shows and things yeah, like that yeah. you that's where you kind of really confront those some of those things right yeah. and um and, and i'd be lying to you if i didn't say that i i've left certain competitions and things because of kind of some of that stuff yeah, right yeah uh, but at the same time, I think like the, everybody knows who Michael Phelps is mm -hmm. and the other really elite swimmers know, 
you know, who the elite swimmers are, I yeah, guess. Yeah. And so at, at some level, you know, and it's hard. You just have to, you have to just realize that's like real talent is recognized. Yeah. So for instance, so Edward Compton, for, for instance, great, excellent Amazing. landscape here. Amazing landscape. Was painter. that the son or the dad? Cause the, both of them, both of them are great. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Both of them are great. So let's, let's say both of them, right? Yeah. Well, they, in to some degree, they were in the wrong country. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think more people know about them today than ever before, yeah. you know, but at the end of the day, I think they probably had this, hopefully a self-satisfaction of yeah. I'm doing some really, some amazing things. Life is just really not going to be fair Yeah. <laughs> on yeah. so many levels. Yeah. And I think the more we can accept the unfairness of life, um, and the more it that can helps roll me. off of you and the more it can forward. roll off of you. Yeah. yeah. I think life to a lot of degrees really doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you have to kind of, yeah, you have to, yeah. it's hard. It's hard to make peace with it. But you, I think for one's own mental health and sanity as an artist, especially like when you make that step to be that dedicated person, um, you know, and I sense that frustration, like in Jacob Collins and, yeah. and others who really have made that devotion and, yeah. and don't feel like that same level of accolades or whatever right, right. Th- is, is due or is yeah. received. Um, you know, cause none of the artists that we've talked about, maybe contemporaries and stuff are household names by any means, Yeah, sure. but we have the, the Thomas Kincaid's on one end or we have, um, the Rauschenbergs on the other, the other side that are, yeah. you know, in the limelight or even, you know, somebody, a plein air painter, which I've never heard of somebody that's like really into landscape painting to talk about how much they like, uh, uh, David Hockney's work, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. But he's the most well-known probably yeah. plein air painter in the world because he's been accepted by right. the establishment, established around. museums. Yeah. Right. It's just unfair. You know, it's just not, yeah. But at the same time, I think, well, you know, I get to see some really cool places. I get to intensely. Yeah. It, I mean, you just got to love the process. Of yeah. It. You have to. Yeah. If you love every forward step you're taking, you can appreciate your work and still look back at it and say, oh, uh, you know, I, don't, I, I could do better. Uh, and you can. Yeah. As soon as you let go of expectations you know i deserve to win this this painting deserves this it's better it's it holds a higher standard whatever your thinking is let it go yeah because because the the art world does not make sense life doesn't make any sense (laughs) and and you just if you love what you're doing but there's also a mindset and i love the like the entrepreneurial mindset which or the uh the the kind of the beginner or the the startup phase, mm-hmm. right? So so great st- the story I love about Steve Jobs. He, you know, he talks about at Stanford. He said, "I'm just going to tell you three stories." Right? One of those stories was about how he got fired from Apple, and he said that was I didn't know it at the time. It was super painful, but that was the best thing that could happen to me because then he was a, a start in a startup phase again, yeah. creative again. And and if we have this if we have this reputation that we feel like we have to defend, we're going to be less creative mm-hmm. about it. And you know, even it, like some of the shows. Uh, well, let's let's talk about Priya de West, for instance. Excellent artist there. Yeah. You know that paint the cowboy genre and stuff like that. But at the same time, with that pressure, and from talking to some of the artists, there's less willingness to take a chance. Right. You have to fit. Or you're, you're kind of your same thing from year to year yeah. or they, or you won't yeah. be invited back. So there, there's the burden of your rep- reputation, yeah, the burden of expectation that will kill creativity. Yeah. And so in a way it's like, I'm okay to, to some degree feel like I want to be in this continual startup phase because yeah. that is the fun part. Yeah. Do you want to be a, a corporate businessman, you know, with yeah. the tie? Cause artists can become that yeah. if they have, to keep producing that sure. stuff. You know, you look at Gerhard Richter who's probably the most famous saw after painter today. And you look at the documentary he talks about, you know, it's, he's sitting there in front of cameras and he's like, you know, this is, I don't know if I really like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and here's where so many artists would love to be in that position yeah. where, I mean, all these cameras in front of you, like a rock star, <laughs> yeah, a true rock star in the art world. Right. 
um, yet feeling like, you know, really artists want to be kind of left alone and be in their right, studio right. anyway, right? Yeah, there is a lot of ambition in, in that startup phase. There's a lot of hope and, and excitement to start something new. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and I've, it's, it's hard. It's hard to look around and see people that maybe are doing the same thing over and over and getting a lot of uh, praise for it, a lot of sales, uh, um, knowing that, you know, the branding is much easier when you kind of stick to a certain thing. Like, I don't want to hear Snoop Dogg come out with a Western album. Um, and I don't necessarily want to hear Willie Nelson rap. <laughs> Uh, right. We, we, we do want to pigeonhole people. We do want them to um, fit within the expectation that they've built for us. But yeah, but at the same time, I also it's... don't want to be self regurgitative too yeah. much. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. And I don't want to have an interest in landscape or figure or floral or whatever and not pursue it um, for the sake of sticking to that brand. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's, it's a tough balance. Yeah, because you look at, you know, like Hamilton, for instance, that would have never happened to a really established yeah. artist, would never have created that. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a, a small... Out of the box. Yeah. Just, Same yeah. thing like the whole criticism with Star Wars, even though these budgets are enormous. Yeah. You know, corporate nature has gotten into yeah. it in a way that it'll never, re- it's, it's never going to repeat yeah. that initial kind of creative explosion yeah you know they're kind of repeating some of the yeah you know make sure ticking off some of the boxes and things right. for the fans and stuff and i get that you got you have to do that for if it's just this big a multi yeah million dollar project but at the same time i don't necessarily envy it yeah like so i went to a couple of conferences where just animators and um uh, movie makers in the kind of visual effects industries yeah. which has been really fun and somebody said which was so great. He said, why everybody wants to get into Pixar or Disney or, yeah. And the guy was like, why, why would you want to do that? Yeah. Go to, you know, like blue sky was tiny at the time. If I were to go back and do all this, again, I'd love to go to blue sky. Yeah. Because you're such a bigger piece in this little smaller pool. Yeah. You have and more now of a voice. You have more of a voice and you have more creativity and more kind of freedom, freedom to kind of explore. Right. right? So I, I think, you know, don't, as if, a piece of advice, don't, don't uh, try and just rush through the startup phase. You know, yeah. it's, uh, I'm, I'm not giving you, I'm giving this advice to myself, yeah, yeah. you know, cause I, I, I would like to, for, there's something in all of us that wants to be the big CEO, right? whether it's of, of your art empire yeah. or, you know, but at the same time, I guarantee you the most fun is, is in that scrappy kind of, yeah. Kind of Trying phase. something new, yeah. Yeah. Experimentation. And that's why we, we also love movies like that. Yeah. We've seen like seven or eight Rocky movies with all the same theme. They keep trying to, Yeah. Uh, you know, we, it's the hero's journey. They get me every time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, um, thanks for bringing us in. Let's for, yeah, uh, absolutely. for, for let me come and talk to you. It's a good conversation. Um, I, what I'd like to do now, if we can, is... Um, Maybe take a look at what you're working on now. If you have any current projects, I really want to give people some insight into uh, how, how you think as an artist and why you make certain decisions, maybe the philosophy behind it. Uh, I think we've gotten into some of that already. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, living with original art is mm-hmm. a, a section that I'd love to end all the podcasts with. So maybe we can look at uh, some of your collection and um, you can talk about why certain artists inspire if that's all right Mm -hmm. um and we'll do that now okay let's do it all right okay so one of the artists that i really admire is ro lee and uh, one of the things that's that's unique about him is you know if you look at a seascape like this there's lots of people that paint seascapes but one thing uh, that he understands is uh the abstract forms and he he turns everything everything's quite solid even though you're not going to see these solid forms in nature, yet it, it's so abstract. If you get up really close, you can just see, you know, each of these large brush strokes. But then you stand back, and it's just so it has so much realism and life and movement to it. Um, one thing that's really interesting too that shows just kind of his power, or just how insanely talented he, he is. All of the white except for a few little spots here, is actually the bare canvas underneath. 
Hmm. And so it, it just shows that he is thinking almost like a watercolorist would, but in a large scale oil painting like this, really quite remarkable where to create like all this foam here, it's just a couple of little scumbled strokes on top and he, he creates this, you know, insane amount of, of form with it. And so this, you know, his ability to in just very minimal amount of strokes and there's nothing really here that has been altered or corrected. It is just extremely confident and he's a very slow painter even though you can see these strokes are, have this kind of energy to it, but each one it just has this kind of really intense thought to it. His understanding of light is, um, I think, to such a degree that he, he sees it better than it actually is, right? He understands where to bring the warms and the cools in, you know, like these touches of, of green, you know, these pinks, warming it up right here as it comes into the light. That's stuff that's it may be in a perfect scenario you'll see it in one little moment here and you'll see this moment here you'll observe all that but he's bringing all of that uh, intense study and knowledge into you know an entire piece so it has just the best of everything and that's like if you're idealizing a figure to have you know like a greek classical form where it's just all the proportions are perfect there's a similar amount of knowledge in terms of the light the other thing I think is his, his ability to create these really natural, interesting, and organic forms. Like this is, to be able to, you know, have this complexity actually work in a painting is just really uh, quite remarkable to be able to kind of sort that out. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very complex, but he's understanding how forms, all these little forms are overlapping each other. And he's getting that sense of perspective in it. And I just don't see a lot of uh, seascape painters that have this kind of level of it. I mean, I, I, there's seascape painters that will paint even maybe more hyper-realistic, but it's just more for photographic. There's nothing photographic about what he's doing here. Uh, it's, but it has this high degree of believability because of that just strong understanding of the space and of, of creating these forms. So, um, Anyway, that's one thing that really inspires me about Rowley's work. Okay, so this uh, scene, this is actually a master copy I did of a painting by uh, John Berkey. And uh, John Berkey's work, uh, if you're not familiar with it, definitely go look it up. He is really well known for these kinds of uh, epic uh, spaceship kind of paintings. And uh, you know, he, he was a very accomplished illustrator in a lot of genres, but I think this is the kind of thing that he's most known for. And uh, what, what I love about his work is his ability to um, just invent all kinds of shapes and textures and colors, but do it in a believable sense of light. So, you know, this is not things that he's, he's ever looking at, um, and, but he's just able to convey all those things. He's also conveys scale and there is a, a realism to it, but also an incredible looseness to his work that I think is really uh, fun. Also very inventive in his color palettes, but you know, like the light bouncing, you know, he knows that there's different types of lights uh, coming in and, and bouncing in different areas, uh, which is very uh, believable in terms of uh, just an understanding of, of the light. And so, uh, you know, I did this master copy just to understand some of those things that he does and, and suggesting certain details. He worked in casein and gouache, uh, which, uh, you know, was a unique uh, combination of medium to, to, to compose these kinds of pieces. But, uh, you know, I did this in oil, trying to kind of replicate some of that, uh, some of those qualities in, in the work, which was kind of a fun exercise. But one, some of the things that I enjoy about his work as well is that a lot of artists in this genre are either really tight, most of them are really tight, but he is able to balance the tightness and looseness. And that's some of the things that I think, you know, if you look at uh, a Sargent or uh, Soroya or Zarn, they really understood, you know, kind of that edge work, and which yeah. is really interesting about what I think works about this. And I, I, I love his balance between just pure love of abstraction and um, 
you know, form and color for form and color's sake. Yeah, and utilizing that um, suggestive quality with something that's completely resolved. Exactly. So yeah. uh, you can just respect him on a couple of different levels. One of just his pure academic knowledge of creating light and shadow in the form. And then other levels is, is creativity and to be able to make every, anything up and any form up and any number of combinations. So a couple of these Matt Smith paintings and Matt is one of those people that is uh, like we've talked about, super dedicated to painting the landscape, um, you know, and he doesn't veer from it. Uh, and he, he's got this consistency to it, but there's so much love of the, the landscape and especially the desert, you know, he, He's taken a genre that has been really overlooked in a lot of ways, of painting dry rocks and desert and stuff like that, but he's done it in such a way that you can see that he's really intensely tried to figure out how to convey uh, the desert. And um, I think you know, you're gonna ha have a hard time finding a better painter, somebody that understands how the desert works, the plant life, and and balancing the aesthetics with just the natural observations and qualities that happen in a piece. Even though he's moved all this, these components and things around, he is really quite faithful to, to, the, to the landscape that he's, he's creating. So you know, just having a balance just shows like that, shows a lot of mastery to it. Uh, and there's just so much you know, subtlety in it. You know, as you look at the, these areas of uh, the aspen with the, with the pine trees, just the quality, the abstract quality of that. It has a lot of naturalism to it, but it's so designed as well. Uh, you can see just this beautiful understanding of a little bit of reflected light as that peak comes up and then it creates that cast shadow, goes a little bit, a little bit deeper in value. Just a real sensitivity to the blues there. Keeps his colors really clean. Uh, he, you know, he's just an exceptional Exceptional painter. Yeah, he's a great designer, great observations. All those little things you're pointing out are just um, constantly in his paintings, just the, those subtle observations of bouncing color and the influence of other colors on, on you know, in the shadows or, or that overall sense of light I've always been impressed with, with Matt's paintings. So this is a painting by Daniel Sprick, and although he's probably most known for his uh, still life paintings. His landscapes are incredible and his, you know, his figures are incredible too. But one thing I like that he does, he adds kind of this eerie quality to all of his work. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that he, he brings that almost, it's a cinematic quality I think, to, to his work that he goes beyond realism uh, in just these interesting ways. And you can see that here like with this type of sky and you know this dark sky and this kind of spotlit, this is something you'd see in a still life. You're just not gonna see it in, um, in a landscape, really. I mean, it would, might be a, a unicorn moment where the clouds part in one little hole right. and you get a bright spot. It's possible, but... It is that cinematic moment, that mood and drama. Yeah, and so you know, compressing the values here and here so you can pop this out. He's manipulating a lot of things. And so I think just it's, he's just a great example of intense observation, but then not stopping there, going beyond it, going beyond the uh, kind of reality of the moment. And uh, you know, also just his mark making is really kind of interesting. You know, he's using just kind of some odd things. I don't even know if this is like a toothbrush up in here that he used or, or what, but, um, this is pretty traditional brushwork, but then, you know, he kind of throws some little different things, a little random sp thicker spot of paint there. Um, you know, it's just a modest little study, but uh, you, can, you can see this, these kinds of moments all over his work. Okay, so this uh, piece by Collie Wilson, he's Australian, and um, uh, we talked about just offline a minute. Uh, he's definitely has this influence of Arthur Streeton, and I love Australian painting tradition, and they're another place, we talked a little about Russia as, as being a place that never left realism. Australia has that same kind of tradition too, where they never really left it, and so, but Arthur Streeton is, is a major influence there, such a fantastic artist, and um, I love Collie's, uh, you know, he's 
he has kind of his own thing going, but you can see that influence, especially in the way he handles these shadows with some of these kind of little edgier, little sharper edges yeah. with the work, you know, that kind of creates that, that vibe to it. So We had a, a fellow piece. student uh, from Australia at the Florence Academy, and he said nobody captures the way Australian light feels better than Arthur Streeton. He just got it, yeah. yeah and, that and every town such, such a similar feel to it that the dark it's almost like a haze of, of purple in the sky, these bright blues, and then that bright sand. It's just the drama of that, the dynamic quality of the color that they use is so um, in, intriguing. And I haven't traveled to Australia yet, so I'm looking forward to actually I seeing know. that kind of light. But I, this kind of r reminds me of you know, you could travel to different places. You go to Italy, there's a special type, there's a, a different type yeah. of light there. Yeah. There's Depends on where you're at in the globe. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to have a different type of light or, or atmosphere. Um, you know, depending how polluted also a place is as well, it's going to yeah. change it. Here's a, a pastel sketch I got from uh, John Harris, and uh, he's in a lot of ways a kindred spirit. His love of science fiction, his love of the vastness of space, uh, is just great. And you can see also his knowledge and, and love of just landscape painting. Is, is all over in this. His understanding, even though you know made up, but just the way the light works here, like in a desert landscape, you know, he just really is able to capture that atmosphere and that mood. And, you know, he's one of those artists that, you know, he's older, he's been, he's been around the block, he's done a ton of science fiction covers. Um, but uh, he also, I think, elevates his work to a level of fine art in the way he designs things and leaves details out, uh, where a lot of science fiction covers and things like that are more really slick and high on detail. He's somebody that kind of um, shies away from that and just goes for more of these kind of graphic uh, statements. And so, uh, and, and one thing's really interesting about him is that he is, although, I mean, he's British, he uh, really is into the Vedas and, you know, the the uh, uh, Hindu philosophy, mm. and that really plays a part in his work. These atmospheric qualities, these mystic ideas, uh, are a real big part of it. And I think that's really neat because, you know, in in British, you know, history, you know, India has played a, a big role in the you know mm. development and psyche of the 19th century British mind. And so he exemplifies that a lot. And he talks about him meeting Arthur C. Clarke, you know, the famous author who who did some of the original science fiction works and um, and just kind of the influence that it had on him. So it, it, is, it was really fun to talk with a guy like this. So, you know, when I collect some of these pieces like this, it's really, I mean, it's, I feel like there's like, like this kind of kindred spirit here yeah. in, in his work. So, you know, I talked about John Berkey and John Harris. I think those two, uh, is when I look at like a lot of people who've done imaginative work, those two really kind of resonate with me. Yeah.